Okay, and you're live. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Melanie Medina. I'm a marine biologist and I'm doing my doctoral work or PhD work uh, at Florida State University in the Levitan lab. Um, although my advisor works with sea urchins and he's been working with sea urchins for over 20 years, I do work with sea slugs. And my work with sea slugs started as a master's student in Cal State LA where I worked with um, a particular group of, of sea slugs. But today we're, we'll talk to you about a little bit about my research, a little bit about what I've done, but mostly about the local sea slugs that we find here in Northern Florida. And we have a variety of organisms to show you today. But the first thing that I wanted to say is that um, there are different groups of sea slugs. So most people know sea slugs as nudibranchs. But in reality, there are um, the um, uh, sea hares, there are sacroglossans, and then there are nudibranchs. There are other types of uh, sea slugs, the, um, the bubble shell sea slugs, and there's another group of sea slugs that um, we don't find in this area. But mostly the ones that, again, most people know are going to be um, the nudibranchs and sea hares. Now, sea hares, if you come close this way, sea hares are the largest of the, um, the three groups that I mentioned to you. And their name sea hare comes from the fact that these two projections on the anterior end of the animal um, are kind of folded and look like hairs. And so if you think of a hair of a rabbit, you think of these little ears. And so um, sea hares have uh, look like rabbits if you ask me, but they're just sea rabbits or sea hares, right? Um, for me to tell you more about these groups, I'll have to go over some anatomical features. These projections that I mentioned to you in the front of the animals are called rhinophores. They're usually very visible in most of them, but you'll see that in some, in a a group of uh, organisms I'm showing you today, you may not see them as, as much. They also have the foot, and the foot is actually here, it's in this animal, it's folding on its foot, but it's just like, as, it, um, as you would think, it's just a foot, a flat surface, and actually, um, Allison, if I can have you, and I'll talk to you about these guys in a bit, but this is the foot, and it's this, um, this area here, and you notice it's very flattened, and so it's usually used for locomotion. Remember, sea slugs are the distant cousins of marine snails and land slugs and land snails. So if you think of land snails, um, they have like this foot that they walk on. So it's very similar to the foot of sea slugs. Now going back to the sea hair and it's starting to kind of move around a bit, you can see there's also these flap things here. And those flaps are projections of the mantle. And the mantle is just another um, characteristic structure of gastropods or in general of mollusks. And so um, thinking back, remember I told you these are distant cousins of marine snails, marine um, land slugs and land uh, snails, but they're mollusks as well. So they're also distant, very distant cousins of squid and, um, and other mollusks. Um, but again, they have these projections here called mantle, and you can see that they're going to be modified in other, um, in other types of sea slugs. Now, they, um, the sea hares, again, being the largest with Aplesia vaccaria, which is a California sea hare, can reach up to, I think it's 50 centimeters long. So it's a pretty large um, individual. And if you notice from the three animals I'll show you today, the sea hare, this is probably a juvenile because they can get uh, pretty large, much larger, maybe twice the size of this animal. Uh, in here, sea hares have a very reduced shell. And when I'm touching um, this part, I can feel the shell. And I don't know if you can see it, you probably can't. But um, when they move, and if you see a video of an aplysia, oh, you can see it there. It's moving its flaps or the projections of the mantle, and that's how they move. So they look like a large butterflies, if you may. So sea hares are pretty cool. These um, come up during the summer in our um, North Florida waters. But we also have a local species called um, 
Borsatella, which is the ragged sea here, and that one usually uh, shows up on the beaches in the winter. Um, so these are pretty cool individuals. Uh, I really like the, the sea hairs. Their appearance is very cute and it's, it's very attractive um, to people, again, because they're also large. Most sea slugs are actually very, very small. So I told you those things about anatomical features. Again, this would be the anterior end of the animal. This would be the posterior end of the animal. Um, they, not all of them have eyes. Uh, some of them use these projections that I told you were called rhinophores as, um, and actually the rhinophores are probably here on this guys, but they use them to sense the environment. And so when, uh, when they have two sets, some of them are to sense food. So if they have them more frontal, um, and then some use it to just sense the rest of the environment. Another interesting thing about these animals and it's related to the research I do, is that they're um, not like you and I, that we have separate sexes. They're actually simultaneous hermaphrodites, so they're both male and female in a single individual throughout their lives. So this individual is not a he or a she, it's actually both. And so one thing that I always um, encourage people to do is to call it it, right? <laughs> English is really nice on that, that it gives us the it, pronoun and so um, because this individual uh, would when it encounters another large individual like this would probably try to fight into either being a male or a female whereas um, a regular you know marine snail like we have some here there will be a male and a female and so they will really fight for resources but not necessarily um, to to take a role of a particular sex so that's where my research comes in, where I'm interested in looking at uh, whether or not or how they, they actually make that selection and how that becomes a conflict or not a conflict uh, when it comes to reproductive uh, outcome. So that's pretty interesting. So this is the largest of the three groups that I'll talk to you about. There are many other groups, like I said, the bubble shell, the cephalid, um, slugs, and then there's the nudibranchs, the sacoglossans, and the sea hares. Now, we don't have any sacoglossans, but the sacoglossans, Allison, if I can have you. So this is our uh, lettuce slug. And so this is a typical sacoglossan that we have here in Northern Florida. If you notice the name, it's because it looks like a lettuce. Uh, in a way, they're beautiful animals. And the difference is that um, these are specialized herbivores. So what they do is they consume the chloroplasts of the algae. So algae are familiar, it's, they're uh, similar to plants, they're not plants, uh, but they're similar in that they have chloroplasts. So they have these structures that allow them to do photosynthesis. So these individuals, what they do is they grab the algae like this and they suck the um, green out of it. And when you see that, and this is only for sacoglossans, and when you see that, you'll see that the, they leave the algae looking white instead of green. And so that the name sacoglossa means sap sucking because uh, they suck the sap out of the algae. So I actually did my master's degree work on sacoglossans, a group of cryptic complex. And the thing with a lot of these organisms is that there are over 3,000 described species of sea slugs, but there are over, we think over 200,000 that are not described. And so one of the things is because a lot of them look like each other, but indeed they're different species. And so with genetic work and morphological work and looking at behavior, we're able to actually differentiate between organisms. So when you look at organisms like this and if I find another one that looks like it but I'm not sure if it's the same species um, we look at their reproductive morphology we look at the teeth they used to uh, feed which is called a radula and we also look at um, some other distinctive characteristics of their morphology this work is it's it's very tedious. There's a lot of work involved in identifying species. And the professor that I worked with out at Cal State LA in Los Angeles um, actually has described over 300 species already. So he's definitely an expert in that. And I'm interested in looking at whether or not reproductive structures of animals 
would actually um, be part of what drives the formation of new species. And there's a lot of literature on that, but nothing on sea slugs. So very few people in the world work on behavior of sea slugs. And these are some of the most um, species-rich groups. So if you look, think of insects, they're the number one group of animals that um, have the largest number of species. Then it's uh, nematodes, but nematodes, very few have de been described, but scientists think that there are plenty more to be described. And then there's mollusks, but within mollusks, gastropods, and within gastropods, heterobranchs. All of these organisms, when you think of a sea slug or a bubble shell slug, a sea hare or a nudibranch, you think of heterobranchs. Now, one thing that I wanna clarify is that all of these organisms that you see here, and all of the ones that I have here, are sea slugs, but not all of them are nudibranchs. And so when you're referring to a sea slug, remember that, that this individual, the sea hare, is not a nudibranch, it's a sea hare. And um, it actually, it's also, um, a vegetarian, it eats algae as well as sacoglossins, but again, these are the larger individuals. Now, this beautiful individual right here, it's a nudibranch. And the name nudibranchia comes from the fact that they have naked gills. So this is the anterior end of the animal, and this is the posterior end of the animal. And I know it's kind of hard to see. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to let it, there you go. And so when you think of the animal, and it's, it's very small compared to the sea hare, but these are the gills. So if you remember, fish have their gills covered by like a plate. Um, sharks have their gills covered by skin. So most organisms have their gills covered um, when they live in the water, but nudibranchs have their gills exposed. And so that's what gives them the name nudibranchia, naked gills. You can see the rhinophores right here, the projections on the anterior end. This is the head, and underneath you'll find the mouth. You can see over here, Allison, if you can come this way. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, we can do this. So if you see over here, this will be the foot, right? Again, the rhinophores, uh, the gills. And then these right here, kind of wiggly, would be the mantle. And so the mouth would be here. And you can actually see, um, if you were to look at a, a video of a, uh, of a land snail feeding, it's the same way these individuals feed. But um, so these are pretty cool. These are the ones that people know the most. They're very colorful. The nudibranchs come in all shapes, colors, and, and sizes. Uh, this is actually a large individual. Um, or a large group, I would say. And then there's this kind, which are the tiger nudibranchs. And if you've seen our little video that we posted at Golf Specimen of these a few weeks ago, are these the same individuals, Allison? Wow, so we still have them from when uh, Cypress got them a few weeks ago, I think more than three weeks ago. So they've, they're doing pretty well. And it's because they feed mostly on sea pansies. So remember what I mentioned earlier that you have sacoglossins, and sacoglossins consume the, the chloroplast of algae. You have sea hares that consume algae, just like you would do a regular rabbit, right? And it's actually um, hanging out on the algae right now. But then you have the nudibranchs, and those are carnivorous, so they eat only other animals. So um, these individuals, for example, these organisms, the tiger, nudibranchs, they'll eat the sea pansy, and um, they were actually nibbling on it because you can see some parts of the sea pansy right here. Now, these are a little bit harder to tell in terms of the anterior posterior end unless you, you know what you're looking for. This is the anterior end of the animal. This is the posterior end. Yeah, this is the, the posterior end and the anterior end. And you can actually see, oh my gosh, can you see the gills? Yeah, so right here, oh no, don't close it. <laughs> right here are their gills. So remember what I said to you that nudibranchs will have their naked gills. So usually they're on the posterior side, like we saw on the regal goddess. 
but on the tiger nudibranchs you can actually see them in between the foot and the mantle so that's pretty cool pretty interesting uh, here's the anterior end again and you can see the mouth and the rhinophores are there right there um, and again they eat sea pansies one interesting thing about this group of animals is the fact that they're specialists on the food they eat so they will not switch diets like you and i do they will specialize on eating one single thing so even at times oh you can see this individual right here sometimes they will specialize on only a single species of let's say sea pansies and so that's actually another thing that evolutionary biologists have looked at to see whether or not the specialization of diet has to do with the formation of new species. And in the case of sea slugs, when my advisor uh, during my master's looked at that, he, he found that they rarely switch diets. Um, that maybe in the past their ancestors did, but other than that, they're very specialized. So this particular species of Northern Florida is probably only feeding on that sea pansy. Even if it has other options, it will not. So one thing that I did for golf specimen last uh, semester in November, Jack Rudlow, um, one of the directors of, of the golf specimen and the founder of it, asked me if I could look at whether or not one of our local sea slugs, um, and again, this is a nudibranch, but remember, all nudibranchs are sea slugs, but not all sea slugs are nudibranchs. So remember that. But this is an aeolid nudibranch. And so what we wanted to know is if it would have a preference for feeding on uh, Aptasia anemones or hydrozoa, uh, pink hydrozoids uh, that we have on the pier. And so, and that would, that's an interesting question because these organisms are very important in controlling fouling populations. So um, when you look at your, and a lot of people here in this area go boating or they have piers. And so you see that around the pier, there are a lot of animals that stick to it. And that's what we call fouling. And same thing, barnacles and oysters and all those animals are fouling organisms. And so they do a lot of damage. And when you have aquaria, if you have um, exploding aptasia, then all of a sudden, how do you remove it? And they continue to reproduce even if you remove it. So these individuals are perfect for that because they can actually control populations of exploding cnidarians. And cnidarians are like hydrozoans, medusae, like corals. And nudibranchs are specialists on eating cnidarians. That is one particular thing about nudibranchs. Many of them will have specialization. Sea pansies are cnidarians, right? So when we did the, uh, and I'll make sure to share this video with Allison, what I did is I looked at whether or not it had a preference. So if you have hydrozoa, if, if you have pink hydrates, it'll actually prefer to have the pink hydrates. But when you had aptasia and no pink hydrates, the animal's like, I'm hungry, I need to eat something. And so it would go and eat the aptasia. And it would eat it in about, I would say 12 hours, it'll eat the entire animal. So it's definitely, um, they're very voracious and these are very aggressive when it comes to reproductive um, moments. They will not be gentle, they'll actually be kind of aggressive when reproducing with, um, with another uh, individual of the same species. But um, when it comes to feeding as well, right? Because they need to feed an animal that will oftentimes be bigger than them. Uh, so we did that and I'll make sure to share with you all the video of it eating an anemone. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about and it's the animal that I actually work with and unfortunately we couldn't find any on the pier to show you. But how big is this? Is this like five millimeters? So this is about five or six millimeters. A ruler for you to see how small these individuals are and these are nudibranchs they're from the genus dodo I think it's a dodo uva but um, this group is very understudied nobody knows much about them even if I go and look on the um, you know professional uh, scientists that work with them there's very little work that has been done and so we find it here locally it's a local species and I work with this beautiful animal, and although they're very small, 
they do what we call reciprocal mating. And because they're both male and females, what they do is that the idea is that when you have reciprocal mating, both individuals will give each other uh, reproductively equally. But that's actually not true. And what I found out is that they have these um, complex behaviors before they assess if they can mate with another individual. They don't always mate if you put them together. Um, so there has to be some type of selection that they're making to their partners, which you don't think about that in invertebrates. You think invertebrates just reproduce, but they actually have a way to select for a good mate. Because remember, they're always male and female. So if I'm a female, I want to make sure my eggs are good eggs. There has to be something evolutionarily speaking that happens in the ocean that makes me or that allows me to select for a good mate so that I can have all these strategies. So there are different um, ideas of evolution and how um, animals select their organisms, their mates, but no work has been done on that in sea slugs, particularly in nudibranchs. Um, some work has been done in some other species and I geeked out obviously I'm a marine biologist that loves sea slugs so I have books about Caribbean sea slugs um, but uh, some of the ones these are the some of the sh bubble shell that I was telling you about earlier um, but there very little work has been done on reproductive strategies of sea slugs or evolutionary work on sea slugs a lot of work is being done on identifying species and describing species and, and we do a lot of work with or thanks to the divers that um, go and take beautiful photos of all of these organisms in the wild. But a lot of work that has been done is with the cephalid um, uh, slugs and again these are particularly interesting. They have these um, the anterior end of the animal has these projections they're very distinctive and so some work has been done on reproduction of this and how they select them but very very little work um so that's all i have let me see if there are any other well you can see on the picture here that allison took um you can see some of the projections this here's the foot of the animal you can see the rhinophore it's actually feeding on the sea pansy you can see the mantle here and it's very characteristic and that's what it gives it the name tiger nudibranch because it has those stripes black and white or white and black if you may um and then it has again these um these gills in here that will actually allow them to um you know breathe underwater but they have a lot of them because that increases the surface area for getting oxygen right um and so I don't know if there's anything else, if, if anybody had any questions for us on any of that before. I know that the one thing that I invite you to do is that in a couple of months, we'll probably have in a golf specimen, a lot of the lettuce nudibranchs. We usually, I know uh, Cypress and Allison will put them on one side of, of the aquarium and they're beautiful. One thing that's also important in these groups is that they reproduce all the time. They're always having sex and they lay eggs. And that's another thing, uh, determining when you lay eggs and if you lay eggs every time you have sex it's, or every time you reproduce, it's also important because it means that you're selecting. So keep in mind, if I reproduce with another individual and I don't lay eggs, because remember, I'm both a male and a female if I'm a sea slug. So there has to be something that the animal is selecting for against laying eggs or for laying eggs. And so uh, that's another thing that I found in my research that not all, they will not always lay eggs after they reproduce. And they can also find, um, there's some theory in, in studies that have been done in other animals um, and, and I, you know, my research was mostly on this animal, but other animals, not sea slugs, where they think that um, even if the individual organism reproduces and lays eggs, that not, those eggs are not necessarily from the individual it just mated with, because they can store sperm. So they can actually reproduce with you, 
reproduce with you, reproduce with you, with the other four different individuals, and they are selecting which they'll make the parent. So they can either reabsorb the sperm, they can either put it in bags. So some of these individual um, species will differ in the number of bags where they store sperm. That's very important evolutionarily because that means that these organisms that you think are not necessarily making decisions are making decisions on how they can reproduce and how they can um, allow some other individual to be the parent of their offspring. And that's very important when you are thinking of reproductive strategies. And it's also important because these organisms all have incredibly um, crucial uh, roles in the environment. Again, I told you, sacoglossins are important in controlling exploding populations, for example, of um, invasive algae. So if you have an algae that invades, these, these individuals will consume the algae very quickly because they will remove the chloroplasts and then the, animal, the algae cannot uh, continue to function and it will die. Is that why they're green? <laughs> That's why they're green. Very good, Allison. Yeah, so actually the color of the animals, and thank you for bringing that up, because the color of a lot of these animals has to do with what they eat. Now, I know that's not necessarily the case for the tiger nudibranch, because the tiger nudibranchs, if you notice, um, the sea pansies, the sea pansies are pinkish, right? These are actually individual polyps. The sea pansy is a colony, by the way. It's a colony of different polyps. So you think that this is one organism, one individual? Uh-uh. There are, I don't know, over a hundred individuals here, and they're a colony. You can see this is actually a polyp right here. I don't know if you can see it. These are all little polyps. So these um, nudibranchs will actually come and nibble and eat on the pansy, so it'll eat the whole thing, and they don't have the colors like the sea pansy because, you know, they're probably eating just uh, the polyps. But when it comes to the lettuce lug, it's green because it eats algae. The sea hares, nah, the sea hares are a little bit um, different. They don't necessarily retain the chloroplast. They just they're herbivores. They're like regular rabbits and, and things like that. Now, when it comes to the regal goddess, which is so beautiful such a beautiful organism it's it's just gorgeous look at the look at this the gills and if i touch it it's like don't touch me <laughs> um they will probably feed on an animal and so they retain some of the color uh from the animal but sometimes the color it's also what we call apostomatic and so it's a way to warn the other animals hey i may be poisonous you don't want to eat me um, and so that's that's a pretty common strategy in nudibranchs. I know. Uh, let me just see if it says um, if it says if it eats anything in particular. No, it just talks about the description in general. Gills have yellow rachis. Okay, they we have a be... question from yeah. one of the viewers, Ruth. She asks, where specifically are nudibranchs found? Like, are they found only here? Like, are they Excellent found in Antarctica? Excellent question. Excellent question, Ruth. So, actually, nudibranchs are cosmopolitan. When we say cosmopolitan, we, we think of everywhere in the world. But, um, unfortunately, the Gulf of Mexico is a very unexplored area, particularly here in this area, thanks to Gulf Specimen Lab. We know a lot about these organisms, but it's a very unexplored area. So, they can be found everywhere. We have a lot of nudibranchs, we have a lot of sea slugs, uh, we have sea hares, we have sacoglossins, a lot in Florida. Most of them, you can find them actually on the eastern side of Florida and by the Keys, because again, it's an area where you have a lot of corals, you have a lot of other animals. So, um, so you can find them there here in Florida. There are a lot of people on Facebook, if you follow a few um, nudibranch enthusiasts, they, they usually do a lot of diving uh, by St. Petersburg, by um, Miami, and again in the Keys. But the most species that we find of all sea slugs are found in the Philippines and Malaysia, in that Indo-Pacific Triangle. So that's actually for any marine um, uh, species that we have, the Indo-Pacific Triangle is the most um, it's the most uh, species reach of all marine systems. 
So think about it as the rainforest of Latin America, right? Think of the rainforest of Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela. Those are all very rich in, in species. And same thing for the Indo-Pacific um, uh, Triangle. It's going to be very rich in marine species, particularly in nudibranchs and sea slugs. So that's a really good question. Now here, some of these um, you find only diving. So usually the regal goddess is really difficult to find. I'm surprised that you all have one. Uh, these we found a few weeks ago when we were trawling for a particular fish. So these actually stay inactive during the day. The tiger nudibranchs are very active at night. And actually sometimes, be, depending on the sea pansy they consume, maybe Allison and I can look into this, depending on the sea pansy they consume. If the sea pansy or the sea pen is bioluminescent, then they will too. So we need to see if the tiger nudibranchs are bioluminescent or they, if, or if they at night they will do that. So I think, I think this will do, because I know these pansies are bioluminescent. And so, um, so they, these are found only underneath this, the sediment. So we didn't find, you cannot find these just going anywhere in the beach, you need to trawl. And that's how we found these three individuals. Um, when it comes to the sea hare, they do approach the water a little bit more. So you will find them coming to shore, uh, but they come Often, I don't know, depending on the area, you will find them in a, in a congregation of them because they're having sex. So they'll be reproducing in, in a lot of, in groups. Whereas nudibranchs and seas and sacoglossans will actually, usually just reproduce a couple of individuals or three individuals at the same time. Now, some sacoglossans uh, actually do hypodermic insemination, which is when you just uh, pick Anywhere in the body you can inseminate your mate. Well, that's pretty cool for sacoglossans. My advisor at Cal State LA does work with a local species called Aldaria willowi. You can look up Patrick Krug. Dr. Krug does a lot of cool work. And we actually look and they have, like, if this is the penis of the animal, they'll have a projection on it that will go and just inject the mate anywhere. So that's also very interesting because now you have a strategy that will allow you to inseminate any pair that you find. If you find any other mate, you'll be able to just inseminate it. But there has to be a way in which if I'm the receiving end, I can actually say, no, I don't want that semen. I don't want you to inseminate my eggs. So these are things that the animal is not consciously doing, but there are mechanisms or ways in which the animal actually makes those selection, selective choices. Um, but, but yeah, so these two individuals, we actually found them on the pier. So when Allison and I were earlier trying to find them, they will only show up around summer to until November, December. And they're found feeding on pink hydrates that we also have in this particular area, usually with oyster beds. So I recently went to Cedar Key to look for oyster beds and see if I would find organisms. They're not showing up yet, but I found hydroids. So when you have the food, the adult, the larvae will start to hatch and then you'll start seeing adults. When you get adults, they'll start to mate and they'll start laying eggs. One particularly important thing is that if you want to find sea slugs anywhere, you find the eggs. So another important thing of these animals is that they do what we call, um, per, uh, they guard their eggs. So that's a way in which you show uh, paternal instincts or, or parenting. Because you will find the adult close to its eggs. So anytime you wanna find a lettuce slug, you will find for the food they eat, but also for eggs. If you wanna find the dodo, you, I look for um, white eggs, the ribbons, they're like little ribbons. And if I wanna look for the Aeolid uh, nudibranch, I find pinkish um, eggs and they're actually more like, um, like little circles. Same thing for the sea hare. They lay yellowish or greenish. And depending on the species, and I actually have pictures, cause that's a way in which we also identify some of these organisms in the wild, it's by looking at their beautiful ribbons of, um, of the eggs. And so for example, this is an Indo-West Pacific 
um, that looks very similar to a regal goddess, actually. It's probably a closely related organism. And you can see the some of the eggs. Look at the eggs of these organism, right? They're like a little ribbon. They look like roses. And they actually feed on other species' eggs. So uh, nudibranchs are pretty, um, can be pretty nasty, if you ask me because they're not only feeding on other nudibranchs, but they're also feeding on eggs of nudibranchs. And so, um, so that's pretty interesting. I'm trying to see if I have more photos, which I thought I did. Oh, we um, have another question. Yes. Um, do they have any predators? <laughs> yes, of course. And so um, I would say regular predators like fish, um, depending on where they are. I know, for example, where we find these two. And remember, this is a, maybe a seven millimeter individual, eight millimeter individual. My individuals that I work with in this uh, organism were like four millimeters long. They are this big, the, as big as my nail, right? So they probably have predators that are like small crabs. We find them often with crabs, fish. Um, so they all have natural predators. But remember with nudibranchs, the fact that they have this bright coloration it's a way that in nature, animals tell you, watch out, I may taste a little gross. And they produce these um, chemicals to per per precisely to prevent predators from eating it. And so all of those um, stripes right here are telling other predators, hey, you don't wanna eat me because I'm gonna taste bad. And a lot of animals will eat maybe little pieces of it and will remember that that tasted bad, so I'm not gonna eat it again. Now with sea hairs, um, I had three sea hairs donated by golf specimen uh, to me last semester. And every time I would change their water, they would get a little scare. And so they would actually release a purple ink. So, um, and if you go to California, and I refer to California a lot because I did a lot of uh, my undergraduate and, and masters in California. When you go there and you look at the big sea hairs, they'll do the same. They'll ink you because that's a way to tell the predators, hey, I have this disgusting thing that is going to hurt you. Um, if you remember other mollusks do that, like um, octopus, they also ink, right? And it's actually an ink. It looks purplish. So sea hairs do that. Um, the way in which the nudibranchs prevent others from eating it is having those aplastomatic colors. And then, for example, for the tiger nudibranchs, it would be having those bright yellow marks that look kind of weird, right? I mean, it's kind of difficult to, to see what you are if I'm a fish, um, if you have those lines where I cannot see if you have um, a distinctive, um, you know, head or tail. If you ask me, these are kind of difficult to distinguish, uh, but they're very beautiful. <laughs> and they're kind of, they're getting uncomfortable, I think. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from Beth Wright, and she asked, maybe you have, I don't know, you probably have answered this already. She asked, when you talk about them making decisions in terms of sexual selection, do scientists who study sea sucks and uterbranchs have any idea how that's accomplished in a physiological sense? <laughs> right, and so actually, no, that's an excellent question. And this is what I fight for when I talk to my committee, because, you know, as a PhD student, you get a committee, so you get these five or six experts that will help you in different areas. And one thing is that we know nothing about the way sea slugs reproduce. When I go in, you may know one thing about Aplesia. One thing I didn't mention to you about Aplesia is that they're very important in neuroscience and neurological studies because they have really big neurons. And so people can actually see and measure things in their neurons. Obviously, they work with Aplesia that are a little bit larger. So uh, people in my department, uh, the neuroscience or neurobiology program, work with Aplesia and looking at how they make decisions and how that is working in your brain. But the thing is that very little is known about the reproduction of a lot of these species. So more is known about Aplesia because we use it in neurobiology. So it's there a lot of literature when I go look for it. A lot of scientific literature is found on Aplesia. But when we talk about if I, oh, Dodo, nothing is known. So I'm the only one that is looking at any of these things. When it comes to the Aeolid nudibranch, we don't even know if these species are the species we're saying. 
So when people study them, which again, nobody studies them uh, as much. We all love them and people take pictures of them, but not even, nobody's really studying them. Only a few groups are studying questions to do with reproduction and sexual selection, sexual conflict, anything like that. And, um, and so no, nothing, very little is known. We think that there's definitely something, it's either you can sense it in the environment, so if I put two individuals that were isolated before, which it's what I do, and I put them together in clean filter water, there has to be something physiologically that it's telling one individual from the other before coming clo into co close contact if you're good enough or not. So their rhinophores, it could be chemicals that they release and their rhinophores help them detect those chemicals. It could be, you know, a sound that I'm not hearing. It could be a movement. We don't know. And actually, we don't know about reproductive decisions in other animals. A lot of discussion is being done in my department about this. There's many of us that are interested in, in how animals make mating decisions because this is important. Uh, but another thing you need to keep in mind is that if, if these two individuals look alike and we don't know that they are different species, they may also know that you are a different species before in, even coming into contact. So very little work has been done in that, but that's what I'm going to make my life work on. So follow me uh, and I'll make sure to keep you updated on reproductive um, strategies of sea slugs because I'm I'm interested in all of them not only nudie brands I'm interested in knowing uh, more about the reproduction of the different groups um, and how that's related perhaps to where they live the type of food right because it's it's the first it's one of the most important things when you're starting to form new species you don't reproduce with this species you were part of anymore you're a new species so those are interesting um, things to look at. But no, nobody has been has studied that. Okay, we have one last question. Sure. Um, Beth asks, um, describe what their nervous system is like. So it's very rudimentary. It's not like ours. They do have a cerebral ganglia. So we have a brain. Think of the ganglia as a very, very small brain. They do have nerves that go around the body of the animal. These little things that you see here, for example, on the dodo are called the serrata, and these are actually projections of the digestive system. So what they do, these in peak hydroids, so they'll put the hydroid part or the nematocysts, the stinging cells that all cnidarians have, and they'll put them in these digestive uh, um, parts of their, or projections of their digestive system called serrata. But the, the, the uh, nervous system, it's, uh, it's not very um, complex. For sea hairs like this one, again, if you see how big it is, their neurons are, I think, as big as their head. Uh, but they have, I, I don't know much about their nervous system, but there's definitely literature that you can find online. Look at this beautiful animal you can find online when it comes to nervous system of aplysia. So make sure you, you look for that. And this little thing here, I'm sorry if you can see it, this is the shell, it's a reduced shell. I know you can see a little bit of it. The gills are somewhere around here. I'm bothering it too much, but the gills are hiding here. Good question. All right. Thank you everybody. And again, keep following us at Golf Specimen. I'll make sure to share things with Allison on, on some of my findings, I have videos. You can follow my uh, Facebook page. Um, my name is Melanie Medina Restrepo, and I'm, I'm sure we can um, have a link for it with Gold Specimen. And I'll try to keep you updated with any new sea slugs that we get with um, here in Gold Specimen. But any questions you have, just send it to us. And make sure to come to Gold Specimen, support Gold Specimen. Uh, they always have animals for you to come and see, and we'll make sure to always have uh, sea hares. I know um, I'm always fighting to get more sea, sea hares or sea slugs here. So join us soon. All right, thank you.